So today's going to be all about practice, but I figured it's probably best to start with the quiz because I can tell by just listening that you guys have a lot of questions. So let's go over the quiz. Now, there, I'm, I'm not going to do every single question, and the questions were different between the two versions, but they asked basically the same thing. Um, some of these were kind of strange that you missed them, but we'll just kind of be obvious with it. Five number summary. When we're talking about the five number summary, that is going to be minimum, quartile one, median, quartile three, maximum. And I know somebody, uh, that's really tiny handwriting. I know that somebody asked me, are those in order? They're always in order. It always goes from smallest to biggest. It's never going to be anything other than that. And it tells me that 196 students took the test. In each quartile, what percent of the population is shown? 25%. So for this version, if I'm going between 73 and 83, what percent should be between that? Between the median and quartile three? That's 25%, so 0.25 or 196 divided by four. For the other version, same numbers, but it said between 68 and 83. That's one, two quartiles. What percent? Divide by two. Lots of folks got that one wrong, and that's just about kind of understanding five number summaries. Now, for both questions B, you had the same exact idea. I just switched up where the numbers were. I moved 15. So when we're looking at this, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, that means 1, 2, 3, 4, this, no matter what, is going to be the median. Some of these are easy to, to cross out. Which number is going to appear the most? There are three Y's. They're all Y's. They're all the same. So it means Y is going to be the mode. No matter which one you're looking at, they both had three Y's. The Y was the mode. Whatever that number was, if that number was 15, 15 would be the mode. If that number was 18, 18 would be the no mode. If it's anything else, those numbers are the mode. It's not going to be 12. And in this case, it's not going to be 18. So that one's out. Then each of them say the median and third quartile cannot be equal. Here's the median. The quartile, I have nine things. So if I do nine times 0.25, that means I should have 2.25 in each quartile. So that means my quartile would go here. That means my quartile would go here. So it says the median and first quartile cannot be equal. Is it possible for these to be the same? Yeah. How? All I've got here is that they're ordered from smallest to largest. These could all be 12. So the median and the first quartile can be the same. And if I look at this one, same idea. This one says the median and the third quartile can't be the same. It's the same idea. If Y is all 18, it perfectly works. Then the last one talks about something being an outlier. The problem is here, we don't quite know where our quartiles fall. But I know at most, like the biggest my quartile range here could be, would be what? Like if I went from 12 to 18, what would it be? Six. So if I looked at that, even if this guy here was 12, if I go out six and a half, two is going to be an outlier. If I go out from this guy at six, we're well past the 19. If I'm looking at the same thing here, it's again, it's six. If I go out six this way, two would be an outlier, but they're talking about 29. If I would go out six and a half this way, 29 is definitely an outlier. These are actual past AP questions. Okay, it's not just, I need you to put the food away, please. Put the food away. It's not just about, can you memorize for me the definitions? 
You have to understand what that means. And these are ordered from smallest to largest. That just means that this cannot be smaller than 15. This cannot be bigger than 18. That's all that means. Does that make sense? There are a lot of people in here that I just wanted to throttle. Uh, number four. Depending upon which version you had, it said either center or spread. The number of people who for center told me either standard deviation, interquartile range, or quartile one, none of those are measurements of center. And for this one, spread, I had people give me mean or median. Yeah, those aren't measurements of spread. Okay. As for the back on both versions, you guys, got it. We made a big deal out of this in class. You need to make sure you start, and please take this into consideration for your investigative task. Your bins have to make sense. Do we start by counting at 17 and then count by sixes? No, nobody does that. That's weird. Do you count, start counting at 600 and then count by 500s? Again, that's just weird. We don't do that. Your bins have to make sense. You have to have something talking about context. You need to tell me what these axes represent. I need to see numbers. I need to see labels. And look, I took two answers here. I took either no or yes for both versions. As long as you backed it up, took, took anything. And then for this guy, uh, you needed to have context. And I actually did two contexts, one shape. Context, because I said one context for talking about the fact that we're disgusting, disgusting, we're discussing roller coaster lengths. And then each of these numbers had to have a feet on them. And again, if you said roughly symmetric and unimodal, your center had to be the, the mean and standard deviation for spread. If you said symmetric, median, and standard, and median and interquartile range. Almost everybody got 6A correct. And the only issue we had on B, if you just say, are any of these cars outliers? Yes, they fall outside the fences. Okay, context, which ones? Don't just say, yep, they're outliers, and then walk away. You gotta tell me which ones are the outliers. Complete, clear, concise, and in context. Does that make sense? Okay, wasn't supposed to be a trick quiz. There were, this was not the best quiz, but there were people who were very successful. And most of the mistakes, I think it's, it's about how you approach the problem. And the only way that we can get better at that is by doing it more and more and more. Please don't think that, ooh, I didn't do so hot on this quiz. That means I'm going to fail. That is not the case. Hopefully, if you see a problem like one of these two, again, on your test, you know how to answer them. But was B a trick, was one a trick question? No, it's just that I, I, yeah, I understand two was a little bit trickier, but I always put one question that I intend to be a little bit trickier. Always. All right, so let's put that away. And let's start talking about, thank you, your classwork. So I know there are a lot of people who are not focusing on their quiz. So I want you to take a second and finish through. I think yesterday we wanted to get through this one, example three, and example four. So start plugging away at some of those. And we will come back and we will walk through the answers with you guys. Okay? So start working through those. Okay. Okay. So when we work through these, it's all about how you draw them. And the nice thing is, is your normal curve never changes. Never. Not in the layout, not in the distribution of percents. The only thing that does change is going to be your context. So this is what I would expect you to draw. A label. I want to see mean, standard deviation, listed out. Now, IQ scores don't really have a label, so I'm not going to get... I'll picky down here about what you put. It's not, or it's not measuring it in something. They're just general points. 
And then you can choose to either do the 68, 95, or 99.7. I actually prefer to do these little percents because I know I'm going to use them. So the question said, for B, what interval would you expect the central 95? That goes from here to here. So between 68 and 132. And I don't really have a label, so I just wrote score for context there. Part C, what percent of people should have high, uh, IQ scores above 116? You can either do this plus this plus this. I did 50 plus 34. Kyle, I need to see you awake. And then it said, what percent are between 68 and 84? Boom, there's my answer. And above 132, add those two values up. Pretty straightforward. Any questions on the IQ score question? I see a lot of people writing. Okay, the next problem. Guys, put the food away, please. Dealt with Rio de Janeiro. So again, when you're working these problems, I want you to start by drawing your normal curve. Put high temp in Rio de J, because I was running out of room. Be good, a good idea. I, I don't care if you write the degrees Fahrenheit here, because I was like getting tired of writing the degrees up there. But somehow you need to tell me that these measurements are degrees Fahrenheit. Again, mean, standard deviation, and then you're going to put your empirical rule breakdowns. I don't care which one you use. A lot of people like that one because it's short and sweet. I like that one because I actually use those numbers. You really should probably memorize 0.15, 2.35, 13.5, 34, 34, 13.5, 2.35, 0.15, boom. It says during a typical January, what percent would be between 77.8 and 81? Ah, 64%. What would you expect to be less than 81? I know that that is 50, because that's half of it, plus 34 is 84%. You guys okay with that? Any questions? Now, for the next problem, did you guys get up through this? Where we were talking about Human pregnancies, because we're going to come back to this problem over and over and over again. Yeah? So what would you say? What percentile is a pregnancy that lasts 282 days? 68%? That's going to be 84. Because it might be on the lines that mark off the 68%, but you're always talking about your percentile is going to be the percent to the left. Your percentile is always going to be what percent of the data is equal to or less than that particular value. That's what percentile means. So what percent of pregnancies last between 234 and 282 days? Did we just not get to this or you didn't get to it? Okay, well then I will pause and I will let you guys work through these. Again, the goal, as much practice as humanly possible. So what percent of pregnancies last between 234 and 282 days? 81.5, good. Didn't say to draw it, you can do this without drawing it. Sometimes I'll just do a number line that marks beep, 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 up where all the different things are. And I might put the, the smaller percentiles in. Which would be more unusual, a pregnancy lasting 300 days, dear Lord, or one lasting 200 days? 200, even though 300 makes you like, Ooh! poor woman. When we do our z-scores for this, that's what it's all about. Comparing things, because these guys aren't nice on my standard deviations. You take your value minus your average, divided by the standard deviation. So I get a z-score for the first one of 2.125. That's my 300 days. 
For my 200 days, I'm going to say 200 minus 266 divided by 16. That I get a negative 4.125. It's not about the positive or negative with this. It's about the distance from average. So the 200 days, it's much more surprising. Yes, you do have to show that because that's giving you statistical evidence. And I understand what you're saying because we're looking at the same scale for each of those. But typically what you will be given is you will be given something like number five where you have two different scales. Okay, because most people would look then at number five and say, well, of course your friend did better. But it's all relative. Okay, and so if you're looking at five, who did better? You did or your friend? You? <laughs> oh, snap. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so when we go through and we do the math for that, when you're in Pro Professor Scrooge's sco uh, class, you scored a 1.18 for a z-score, whereas your friend got a 0.81. You did further from the average in the good direction. So relative to the rest of your class, you actually did better. Okay, You've never had teachers like that, right? Where your friend has one and you have another and nobody's ever experienced this before where one teacher's like, oh my lord, and the other teacher's like, oh, that was easy. It's not just because they are different standard deviations. Well, that's what a z-score is. A z-score is the number of standard deviations away from the mean that you are. So that's exactly what they did here. And so for when I did the work, da -da -da -da, there you go. You can see that's exactly what I did. How many standard deviations away from the average are you? OK? Yes, yes, because in this one, we want to do better than average. Better than average on a test means a higher score versus better than average when running, when speed is concerned, we want to have a lower score to be better than average. So that little better word is very context specific. Okay, all right. So... Let's try one more of these, and then we're going to move on with calculator stuff. So the first two are pretty straightforward, right? A, a and B is just draw the normal curve, and then find 1%. So what I did here, making sure that I labeled weight of elite distance runners, and I made this axis kilograms, I put my numbers, and I like the smaller little guys, but empirical rule is also just fine if you do the 68, 95, 99.7. I just almost never use those numbers, so I, I tend to not draw them. The empirical rule is met by either one of those sets. And so that meant that on question B where it says, tell me what is between 48.7 and 67.9, what I did is I took 50 minus the 0.15, and then I added 34 to it. Or you could have just done this plus this plus this plus this. And that is your answer. Then, then we hit 60. 60 kilograms. Is 60 one of my nice pieces? No, it's not. So what you're going to do Whenever you have something that is not a nice piece, you guys following along with me on this? Because this is must-see information. You start by calculating your z-score. Your z-score is going to be the value that you're looking for minus the mean divided by the standard deviation, which here was 4.8. So my z-score... Mean minus standard, uh, uh, sorry, value minus mean divided by standard deviation. I get negative 0 0.6 z-scores simply because of the table. And here's the table. It's actually table F in your book. Z-scores because we have, oh, it's over here. 
we have the ones and the tens over here, and we have the hundredths up here. Z-scores are only ever taken out to the second decimal for that reason, because of the table. So I'm going to put 0.65. And what we're looking for here is the probability of getting a Z-score less than or equal to negative 0.65. Very, very nice. Ready to do this? If you watch the video for the link I sent out, all you needed to do was say second distribution. I'm giving you a value. I'm looking for a percent, so I'm going to use normal CDF. And since I'm going less than, I'm going to do my crazy nines, which is basically what that is. It's just, you know, I don't want to take the time to type that in. And I'm going to stop... Now here's your choice. Is everybody looking up here? This is your choice. I personally choose, no matter what, you have to calculate the z-score. But I choose to put in 60, because that's the length I'm looking for, where the mean was 63.1, and the standard deviation was 4.8. And it tells me 0.2592. Had you chosen to go the other way around and said second distribution normal CDF from negative 1e e to the 99, which is just a bunch of negative 9s. Whoa, that was not what I intended to do. And go up to negative 0.65, where the mean and standard deviation, if I use z-scores, those are 0 and 1, you get a very similar answer. Now, this is not quite as accurate because this is using a rounded z-score. But do you see how very close they actually are to each other? Um, if you're going to use the z-score method, what I want to see you do is you'll do the calculate your z-score. And then I will want you to use the store key and x. So it looks like that. Store is x so that it's not using any rounding. And then when you do your distribution, use the x. Now it's going to be the exact same as what we had up above. 2591193, on and on and on. Do you see how that's done? You don't want to round until the very, very end, which is why I kind of prefer to use this is my value, this is my mean, and 4.8 is my standard deviation. You have to calculate it anyway, but let's make, say you make a mistake with the calculation, you can still get points back for that guy. And then for part D, yes? Okay, so did you store it as X? So then you go to second distribution. Uh, let me clear. Second distribution, normal CDF, goes from negative 9s to X, 0, 1, because those are my standard deviation, because it's Z-score. And then calculate. You're getting 0.6. Okay, I'll be over there to look at it in a second. Now, for problem D, it's a little bit different. They're asking me who has a percent body weight, up, uh, what percent has a body weight above 70? 70 is right here, and we want this guy. No matter what, what you will do is you will start by calculating the Z-score for 70. This is required. Z-score for 70. So you do 70 minus the average, divided by the standard deviation. Again, that was 4.8. So I'm going to calculate that. Making sure you hit either put the 70 minus 63.1 in parentheses or hit enter before you divide by 4.8. That will mess you up. And so my z-score here is 1.43, oh, 1.44, but I'll write that out because it's a nice number. And we're looking for here, now this is my probability statement. 
I want to know the probability that the, my uh, weight is above. So what will I use? What symbol goes here for above? Greater than. Okay. And if that's the case, again, you can do this multiple ways. I'm going to do them both. You can store that answer as your x, because you had to calculate it anyways. And then go second, distribution, normal CDF. But for this one, if I wanted to draw it, and this is why sometimes they say, go ahead and draw it. I know the 70 is over here, and I want to find that portion. So where is my lower value? 70 is as low as I'm allowed to go. How high am I allowed to go? As high as I freaking can go. Crazy nines. And since I used 70 as my lower value, I'm going to use my mean, which was, again, 63.1, and my standard deviation of 4.8. If I use a data value, I use the data mean, the data standard deviation, and I calculate. And I come up with 0.0753. If I want to do z-score, normal CDF, this time my z-score here was 1.4375. I'm going to go from my x to crazy nines, and z-score is always 0 and 1 for mean and standard deviation, and you get the exact same answer. Okay? Do you all understand what I'm talking about here? All right, now the last question is a little bit different. For the last question, what we're trying to do is we're trying to find the 45th percentile. So we want to know what value I can have here. So that 45th percentile, does that mean 45% are above or below? Whenever I give you a percentile, below. So some number, below some number is going to give me 0.45. We are looking for that value, where again, I'm going to use the mean is 63.1, and the standard deviation was 4.8. This is the work that you would show for a problem like this. And all you would do is you would go to second distribution. No, that's tangent. Second distribution. When I'm given a percent and I'm looking for a probability, use inverse norm. And while my option here says left, center, right, for this class, leave that always on left. That is the one thing. If we're not going to be using our tables, we still have to stick with the idea that it's the area to the left. And so I'm going to say my area to the left is 0.45. My mean is 63.1. My standard deviation is 4.8. That means to be in the 45th percentile for body weight, I need to have a weight of 62.4, oh, let's do 50 oh, kilograms. Okay? That right there is the extent of what we're practicing today. Those few calculator buttons. All right. So hopefully you guys, like I said, again, watch the video because it gave you step-by-step -step calculator instructions. Now I just want to kind of go over and make sure that you got those instructions. So what I want you to do first, very simply, I'm giving you a z-score. If you really want to use your table, okay. Don't use your table, that's horrible. I want you to find the probability that we have a z-score that's less than 2.85, 
greater than negative 1.66, greater than 2.85, and then between. Okay, so use your calculators to calculate that. If I'm doing z-scores, what do you need to use for your mean and standard deviation? Zero and one. Good, go for it, please. Should be easy peasy lemon squeezy. So for that, what command should be using on your calculator? Which command are you using? Normal CDF, inverse normal, which one is it? Normal CDF. I give you a value. I want a probability that is always going to be normal CDF. Okay? And when you're talking about probabilities, how many decimals do I want a probability out to? Four. And again, there's a reason for that. And that's because if you were to look at your table, all of your probabilities in your table are all given out to four decimals. So for number one, what is the probability of getting a z-score less than 2.85? Point. What, what'd you get? Come on. Point nine nine seven eight. That's all you wanted. Hey, here's a question. What's the smallest your probability can be? Zero. What's the largest your probability can ever be? One. So if you give me a number that is outside of that range, you should know automatically you are wrong. Don't do it. All right, what's the probability of a z-score being greater than one point, negative 1.66? Is it going to be bigger than a half or less than a half? Bigger, because that's negative, but I'm going greater than. I also actually know one standard deviation is about 34%, so this should be bigger than 84, or 0.84. What do you get? 0.9515. Are we starting to feel a little bit more com confident with this? I know I got it wrong. It couldn't have been that easy as just pushing buttons. Actually, yes, it can. Okay, what about a z-score greater than 2.85? Will that be a big number, closer to 1, or will that be a small number? Small number, because I'm talking about greater than, and 2.85, that's almost 3. And I know above 3 standard deviations is only 0.15%. So this is going to be a small value, 0.0022. I didn't give you a chance to say it. But does, does my, I wanted you to, to see the thought process here. Without even putting in answers, I can use what I know about the empirical rule to kind of gauge what kind of an answer I should have. So that way, if you're doing a multiple choice, you could actually do process of elimination without even doing any more work. Okay? What about between negative 1.66 and 2.85? Which one's that? There you go. Have some confidence, people. 0.9494. Are we getting okay with our calculators? Your calculator is your best friend. It's your uh -huh. So for this problem here, oh, I mean for, for, thir for number three or four? For four, yeah. So for four, this is your lower number, the negative 1.66. And the upper number is 2.85. You would do lower is negative nine 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 nine. Upper is two point three five. Okay. All right. So if you're given a z score or a specific value, and I can't say this often enough, if you are given a value or a z score, the command you use is normal CDF. If you are given a probability or percentile, and I want a z-score, what do you think you're going to do? Inverse normal. Because an inverse is what takes you 
back. Okay. So if you aren't given a z-score, the thing that you need to make sure, even though I can calculate this in my calculator, calculator, calculator without doing any work, you are required 100% of the time to give me a z-score. Do you understand that? <laughs> you being sarcastic, you have to calculate a z-score. So if I ask you at what percentile is a pregnancy that lasts 240 days, what do you think you're going to do first? Z-score. Thank you, Kiernan. Someone's paying attention. Cameron is not. So you're going to start by calculating the Z-score. Whether you use your Z-score in your calculator is up to you. I don't care. But you got to calculate it. Now, percentile. If I say what percentile are you, is that less than or greater than? Less than. Anytime you see the term percentile, it is always the values less than or equal to you. Okay? And technically, for these guys, because probability is calculated using, really, it's an integral, it's calculus, uh, there is no area under a specific point. Whether you put less than or equal to or less than will give you the same value. So, this is not appropriate writing for work. That is called calc speak. Do not calc speak on a test or a quiz. What's appropriate for work here is you would show me your calculations of a z-score. So far, so good? Calculations for a z-score. Then you would have to show me some sort of a probability statement, and you have a choice. You could either choose to write, then, the probability that x, because x is our specific value, is going to be less than or equal to 240. You could say the probability that z, because we're talking z scores, is less than or equal to negative 1.63. Or you can sketch a normal curve where you put the mean at 266. You draw out your standard deviations, and then you would say 240 days would be someplace over here, and you would color that in. Any of those three are appropriate. Do you understand what I'm talking about? No? You have to show me one of these in conjunction with your answer of 0 0.0521. What you cannot do is use calc speak. I am putting this up here for your information. This is how I got that answer. But that is not appropriate work. There's going to be one time and one time only that calc speak is appropriate. We're not there yet. Okay? They're very specific about this. So if I'm going to find the percentile of pregnancies or the percent of pregnancies that last between 240 and 270, what do I need to do first? Z-scores. Hey, guess what? I've already done that one. You don't need to do it again. It's not going to change. Your mean and standard deviation haven't changed, so the Z-score for 240 is still negative 1.63. But what do I need to calculate? I need to calculate the 270. You must show me the calculation for the score. Allo. That was fast. Okie dokie. So what's your answer? Point, point 0.25 is your z-score. And what is your probability that you're between 240 and 270 days? 
point something 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 something. Yay, calculator. Are you using normal CDF or inverse normal? Normal, because we're looking for percent. What's your lower value? If you're using 240, what's your upper value? What is your mean? 266 and your standard deviation? 16. Or you can use the z-scores themselves. Again, this is not the acceptable work. The acceptable work for that one, you could obviously still draw the picture, or you could make a statement like this. The probability, either that your x is between 240 and 270, or the probability that your z is between negative 1.62 5, didn't quite fit in there, or 0 0.25, and then your answer. Or you could draw the picture where you're shading in between here and here, or wherever that would be, okay? But you must have one of those. How many of you prefer the X statement? The Z statement? The picture? Okay, so most of us are onto the statements. That's great. It is okay. You do not have to use what I've got shown up here where I have z-score, z-score, zero, one. I love using the actual values. I'm lazy. As long as you show your calculations for the z-scores. Okay? All right. So there was my work. Here's the next one. I am giving you a probability, a percentile, an area. Those are all considered the same. I am asking for the z-score. What will you use? Inverse norm. Go for it. Mm -hmm. Everything go okay, Eden? Good. She's like, ooh. If I am looking at this first one, which z-score, guys, come on, please. What z-score goes with 0 0.2005? And how far should z-scores be rounded out to? Z-scores are just two. So negative 0.84. Z-scores are the one kind of... Um, Exception to our rule about rounding, these scores go out to two decimals, and that's because that's what your table allows for. As long as you put the correct ones, no. If you put wrong ones, yes, it could hurt. Number two, what is your z-score? Negative 0.29. We feeling good with this stuff? Okay. <laughs> uh, what is this asking you? What, what area is this talking about? 0.25, because that's the 25th percentile. So 0.25. So what's your z-score? Negative 0.67. And what about for a probability of 95th percentile? 0.64. Some of these numbers are going to become very... So for this one, I would have done my area is 0.95. Zero and one for my mean and standard deviation. <laughs> I just say I don't have texting thumbs, so, you know. So now for this one, we get to go back to this wonderful idea that you don't actually need to use z-scores all the time. You can do this with z-scores, but it's a lot simpler to say, knowing my mean is 266 and my standard deviation is 16, by the way, though, our textbook uses this notation. It's not appropriate on the test. You have to tell me mu equals and sigma equals. Okay? They, it, you have to be perfectly clear that you understand what you're talking about. So the probability that a pregnancy falls at the 95th percentile, 
So that means I'm looking for the probability of some value where x is less than it and it gives me 0.95. What do you get? 292, context, day-long pregnancy. Or 292 days. Now, the next one says at what length of pregnancies would create an interval between the 25th and 75th percentile. So what we're doing here is we're going to do this twice. Once for 25th, once for 75th. So for the 25th percentile, what is your length? How many days? Can you hear me? 255? 255. Do I hear 240? Do I hear 240? Yes. 255. And what goes with 75%? What goes with 75%, ladies and gentlemen? Should be 276. What you have to understand with this is we're talking about how many days. If You're not going to round up with days because whether it's on the 266.1 day, that means it's right in the morning, or 0.99, that means it's, at night that day, it's still on that day. Do you understand, guys? So you have to be carefully thinking about your context. Now, if I'm talking about a pregnancy that creates an interval from the 25th percentile to the 75th percentile, what percentage falls in that window? Everybody get that that's 50%? So the way this question would normally have been phrased is what days mark off the middle 50% of pregnancies? And so what you would do is you would say the middle, that's going to be 50%. 50 is the block size I'm going for. So how much is over on this piece? 25, how much is over on this piece? So 50 plus 25 is 75. 50 minus 25 is 25. Because they'll say, where are the middle 50% of pregnancies? Where are the middle 90% of pregnancies? Where are the middle 80% of pregnancies? They will ask you those questions, and that's what it's talking about. Your middle is always the 50. Balance that block half on either side. See where it takes you. Okay? So try this one. This asks one of those middle percent questions. 